just a couple more minutes um, for folks to join us, but we're so happy that you are here. That's my child. <laughs> a great soundtrack. All right, I'm gonna give folks about one more minute and then we're just gonna jump on in. All right, welcome officially everyone to the California Criminal Justice Funders Group, our third um, and final funder education series. Um, today we are talking about grassroots organizing um, with some incredible organizers and funders and I'm very excited to have them all here with us and all of you with us as well. Um, this is our third of a three-part series that got started back in March um, at the beginning of what we were coming to understand as a global pandemic and we are continuing to hold all of our members and our community inside in our hearts and hoping that you all have continued to stay as safe and protected as possible throughout this strange time. Um, we also know there's lots of Zoom fatigue, so I'm feeling grateful for folks joining us and knowing that, that pre your presence um, indicates a commitment to our communities and to the organizing that, that needs to happen in order for us all to be free. Um, in March, we started off the series with a session on prison industrial complex abolition. Um, I'll be adding links to the chat for where you can view the recordings of these sessions in case you missed it. And then in May, we um, held our middle session on healing justice. And today we're closing up with grassroots organizing. Um, and you know, amongst the steering committee of CCJFG, we were really trying to create a space for funders to learn about terms often heard, but not very deeply understood or internalized. And we hope that this series has done that and really see these three as very intimately connected, organizing as a huge piece of healing individually in our communities, healing collectively and healing from the impacts of the prison industrial complex and organizing it as the vehicle that gets us to our North Star of abolition. So today we're like digging into the foundation of our movements. Um, not all parts of it are seen, um, understood or funded. So we're hoping that you leave here with a greater sense of um, all that it takes to organize. And um, yeah, this is a series that is organized by CCJFG. Um, I'm Adrian. I should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> I'm the coordinator of the group. 
Um, and if you are interested in organizing a webinar yourself as a CCJFG member, we are always working with and collaborating with our broader membership. I'm also going to just add a link to a registration for our session webinar that's happening next week called Our Freedom is Tied Together, Immigration and Incarceration. Um, it's going to sort of function as like a really beautiful um, part two of this Grassroots Organizing 101 because we're featuring folks um, who are organizing at that intersection of incarceration and immigration, including two people who've experienced both state incarceration and ICE custody. So hoping you all can join us for that as well. Um, thank you for being here. I will pass it over to Alex Tom, who is the director of the Center for Empowered Politics to lead us into this session. Great, thank you, Adrian. It's such an honor to moderate this panel and uh, you may hear my child uh, soon <laughs> or you already hear him, but I think it's so important to have these kind of conversations, especially to do this series of funder education. We are really in confusing, exciting and inspiring times all at the same time. But before I begin, I wanted to share a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm born and raised here in San Francisco and the Bay Area. I got involved in youth programs, uh, politics in high school, and I went to college at UC San Diego where I did youth and community organizing uh, by the US-Mexico border region in the 90s and during 9-11. Then after that, I decided to come back to my own community and started organizing in San Francisco Chinatown at the Chinese Progressive Association, did that for 15 years. Um, I transitioned last year, went to Vietnam for six months for a family sabbatical, and then started the Center for Empowered Politics, which is a movement capacity building hub. Now I live in Oakland uh, with my partner, her mom, or my mother-in-law, I guess, <laughs> and my awesome autistic six-year-old son. So um, what do we mean when we say grassroots organizing? I wanted to say a little bit more about that. There are a lot of phrases that get thrown around in philanthropy, in the movement, like civic engagement, mobilizing. Um, I'm gonna share more about grassroots organizing and to, and to provide a basic overview of how it happens. To me, grassroots organizing has always been about taking care of the basic needs of the community and then to organize them towards long-term social change. It's a process, right? This is not a new concept. This comes from a long tradition of mutual aid in this country. And I'm talking about the radical mutual aid, not the kind that we um, talk about now so much. It's not charity, right? It's empowerment. And the Black Panther Party, uh, the Serve the People programs. So in fact, CPA founders in the 70s were inspired by the Black Panther Party and modeled our work after them for us, we see that we are organizing through our services. So for example, half of our budget is from the city for workforce development, housing, worker outreach. So, but here's like the funny dynamic, right? When we're around service providers, we're not seen as legit because we're too political, right? They're like, oh, why are y'all doing it like that, right? Why are y'all adding on trainings on top of the services, right? And then honestly, in movement groups, um, in organizing groups, we're not seen as radical enough because we're getting money from the government. Well, our view is that money is actually our money, right? Those are taxpayer dollars, right? So the other, the other way we think about this is like, this is a model of whole person organizing. So what do we mean by whole person organizing? It means that people in the community are not the silos or the single issue campaigns we create. Workers are moms, they're tenants, they have many other identities. And these are the false binaries that we need to learn to break, right? We need to learn to invest in all the interconnected pieces to organizing, not just the policy campaigns. Grassroots organizing is a critical component of building power and it's about following and guiding them in their individual, but also the collective journey of their transformation. And there's not, there's not like an us and them, like we are all part of the same movement, right? So what I wanted to do is, um, is to share a few pictures um, and share a story 
of one of the first um, member leaders that I met in 2004, 16 years ago. I was a young pup. <laughs> so that's a picture of me. And this is a picture of a son. And um, she worked at the King Tin restaurant. And it was the first minimum wage case in San Francisco where they weren't paying minimum wage. And at the time, there were only 15 workers. And she only came to two meetings. She went to the first meeting to sign up and then the last meeting to pick up her check. So her check was the largest. So if you look at the check, it's really big, $80,000, $85,000. Her check was $60,000. So needless to say, the other workers were not, they didn't like her too much because <laughs> she didn't do too much, right? She didn't, she just didn't show up. Um, but still, she decided to be a member of the organization and and you know, like I would say in this situation, in the traditional organizing handbook, she's not one of the leaders that we identified because she sort of just like floated on the coattails of all, all the other folks. But you know what, she's part of the community and that's how we do things. We treat people as family, right? So she came to a lot of our picnics, all our social events. Um, we had like workforce programs she participated in. Uh, she finally started getting involved in our leadership development programs. Um, but for many years, she shied away from getting involved um, for anything, from protests to political meetings. And honestly, some of the organizers wanted to give up on her because, because they were like, she's not even showing up for like, you know, basic things. But our policy is to always keep the door open for people who want to be involved. They can also leave when they want and they can always come back, right? We don't close the doors on anybody. So the question is like, how did she, 10 years later, after being in our organization, how did she become the key leader of our groundbreaking settlement at the Yangtzeing restaurant of 280 workers? I don't know if, I can't really see if folks are raising their hands, but, um, okay, Colin, um, anyways, Folks know Yangtzeing, the restaurant, is like one of the most expensive dim sum restaurants on the waterfront in San Francisco. And um, she became the key leader for getting this $4.2 million settlement. So Adzan worked at many restaurants before, and then she worked at the Yangtzeing restaurant for three years, but she was unwilling to come forward. She was the sole breadwinner of the household. Her husband was disabled. Her daughter was in college. Her son was unemployed. Her job in Chinatown was paying her $5 an hour. And then at the waterfront, they're getting paid $7 an hour. Minimum wage at that time was $10.55. So even at the waterfront, she wasn't even getting paid, right? But she was like, it's better than Chinatown. So this is a picture of us trying to crunch her to, <laughs> to join the campaign. And she was still very resistant. So we decided to move forward with the campaign with three workers literally <laughs> then we got to six workers then then after we did the labor investigation we got to 20 workers and then finally 40 but if you have 40 workers out of 280 that's still not enough but um we moved we moved forward with this and we started organizing and for months for months and here's some pictures of our delegation this is our meeting this is um our delegation where we snuck where we snuck into the um, the kitchen and we basically did a delegation on the boss and here's a picture of the delegation you know we believe in um, not shaming bosses you know restorative justice and all that this kind of joke but um anyways um but yeah so this is the boss being really um, angry right but um but Adan didn't show up to this right and it was really sad but um what happened was basically she eventually at one meeting she stood up and it was in a room of workers uh, politicians and allies and she decided to speak up and when she finally when she finally stepped forward she brought the next 40 to 60 workers with her and that's the moment that i saw victory and you could say that's because of the numbers but i saw her transformation her transformation transformed the entire workplace everybody was ready 
to stand up for their rights. So I just wanted to share this story. You know, th this is at during the negotiations, um, and then this is like the when we finally we finally got the notice that we would win. Um, but she ended up becoming a speaker at many events for hundreds of people, and she's now one of our most visible leaders. But that long process and that journey of ten years, where she was basically under the radar. Right, I just want to lift that up. And here's another picture of her. Okay, so my time is getting close. I just wanted to end on this slide, is that grassroots organizing is very critical to building power. So in this, if in the, you look at this diagram, right, I think you can hear a lot of these big words like civic engagement, mobilization, community building, um, services. Now, these are all very important but standalone are not enough. They need to be integrated to grassroots organizing. And grassroots organizing is the process, the journey of deeply engaging a base of people for the long term towards collective action. So collective action is like a lot of different actions together, right? And they gotta change people's conditions, right? And shift the power relations. This can happen at a workplace, behind bars, outside, I mean, in the community, it's like you need, people need to like believe that they could change power, right? And so this, this diagram, you've probably seen many versions of this is sort of like USC peers, um, flower power thing. I just wanna show that one organization actually can do all of these things, right? And a lot of community organizations like ourselves, we do that, but there are some youth organizations, let's say just do art and culture. They might not do organizing right? They might do leadership development, but they might not do, you know what I mean? So it's like, just, we believe that this is an integrated strategy. So just kind of moving into the next section, I'm no a little bit above um, over time, but I just wanted to say that I'm like really, I'm really, really excited to dig into this conversation. And I'm, you know, we got a fabulous panel. I'm glad this is being recorded because there's just gonna be so many nuggets. Oh, I still have two minutes. Okay, cool. So there's a lot of good <laughs> nuggets of information. And um, the first person that will be speaking is um, Romarilyn Ralston with the um, California Coalition of Women Prisoners, who is gonna be talking about grassroots organizing across, across walls, inside and outside and across, right? Then we're gonna have Abraham Medina from the California Alliance for Youth and Community Justice, who will be talking about grassroots organizing outside of urban cities. And then to close us out, and we'll do like some Q and A with them. And then to close us out, we'll have Tamu Jones from the endowment who will talk about making the case for funding grassroots organizing and funding the long-term work that is needed. So with that, I'm just gonna kick it over to Romarilyn to get us started. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you everyone for joining us today, this afternoon uh, for this panel. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Ro Marilyn Ralston. I'm an organizer with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. I'm also formerly incarcerated. I spent 23 years at the California Institution for Women. I was incarcerated at age 24 and released at age 47. And I came to organizing work in the prison. A friend of mine, Cherie Shoemate, who is a co-founder of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, CCWP for short, um, was the first organizer I had ever come into contact with. She was suffering from sickle cell anemia in the prison at the time of the height of prison expansion here in California. Um, there was thousands of women in the prison and she had really poor medical care. And she organized a class action lawsuit and got women on the inside of prison involved in that organization, uh, women on the outside and CCWP was born out of her work around poor medical care for incarcerated women uh, at the two women's prisons here in California. And so that's how I came to organizing work um, through the strength of one person inside of the prison. So as Alex mentioned, it's about coming together um, collectively and mobilizing 
and being involved to care collectively uh, for people because that's the bottom line. You know, how do we help other people with our grassroots organizing? So CCWP has been around 25 years. We are an abolitionist grassroots organization. We have a chapter in the Bay Area located in Oakland and a chapter here in Los Angeles. Um, and we have been supporting women, gender non-conforming people and transgender individuals in our California prisons for over 25 years. Grassroots organizing across the walls is a little challenging because we have so many members inside of our prisons that need support from a variety of, of issues that we, we help with, legal issues. We have a visiting team, we have a letter writing team. We work on pardon and commutation applications, uh, parole support. And it's, it's an incredible amount of work to do for small organizations like CCWP. But what comes out of this work when we do mobilize and care collectively and that we do this work across the walls is a bridge, you know, connecting the free world, as we call it, or the community with those who are incarcerated so that not only they see themselves in the community doing work, but that we're now in proximity with those inside and we understand what the real issues are. Because that's what it's really all about, having those connections to people so that we can understand the real issues. So we're able to center the leadership of those most impacted by mass incarceration. That's how I got involved post-release with CCWP. I was invited to come into the group because of my organizing work in the inside and join them on the outside to continue to inform legislators, community organizations, um, to do that political education that needs to take place so that folks understand what's happening inside our California prisons and why we need to reform some of the criminal justice laws that we have in this state and abolish prisons at the same time. So I'll just speak a little bit about centering our members and their basic needs. It's critical to our work. With thousands of incarcerated people uh, here in the state, I think we're now hovering around 100,000 incarcerated people. About 5,000 of those folks are, are, are women and gender non-conforming and trans folks in our prisons. And so we wanna make sure that CDCR, the prison system understands the needs of all genders so that we're working towards survival. 90% of incarcerated individuals have been traumatized through either sexual violence or some other type of physical violence or community violence. So trauma is a big part of what we work with uh, inside of prisons. And we wanna make sure that we have members inside not only surviving the trauma that led them to incarceration, but once they're released, that there's a warm handoff, that there's someone on the outside of those prisons to take care of them. And that's what CCWP does. We have welcome home celebrations. We have employment opportunities. We have leadership and training, all those things that Alex just talked about and that you saw on his power map around grassroots organizing is what the California Coalition for Women Prisoners does. I was hoping to show a photo um, of our group and some of the collective organizing that we've done around legislation, policy and advocacy work, uh, political education is very important because we want to make sure that we expose the dichotomy between grassroots organizing and direct services and the divide that it creates. Yes, I do <laughs> um, want you to show the photo. So um, it's, it's really interesting because uh, folks sometimes don't understand Thank you. So here's a photo of, of one of our group meetings in the Bay Area, not long after I was released. 
Uh, so I was released in 2011, and that's me there in the center of the floor with many of the volunteers that worked on my campaigns. Um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the California Coalition for Women Prisoners working on my free battered women's campaign and continuing to organize around my release through parole board support, medical care, visiting, and legal representation. And then when I came home, finding a place for me to continue to do policy and advocacy work because of my lived experience and valuing my expertise. And so I, I think that's really a, a beautiful way um, of showing how grassroots organizing kind of differs from other types of uh, agencies and organizations. Without small groups that really walk you through a process, and I think Alex, again, really brought it home in, in his presentation when he talks about taking care of the basic needs of the community for the long-term goals. The long-term goals for, the, for CCWP is abolishing prisons, reducing the prison population, decarceration, you know, supporting women, making sure that they have the support on the outside and on the inside so that we can participate in, you know, the political process, civic engagement, have a quality of life outside the prison and after prison so that we can thrive and then give back to those who we've left behind, which is really a, a key piece of CCW's work, caring collectively, creating mutual aid so that we can give back. Because of COVID-19, we've had to change our meeting styles with, with meeting in person and going in and out of the prison to make sure that members are cared for, to now providing aid you know, to make sure that folks have stamps so that they can maintain their family reunification, and their connections with their community, you know, that they have food, that they have medical care. We've spent weeks and weeks, you know, advocating for our members on the inside and all those who are incarcerated to get medical care, to get information about COVID-19. And unfortunately, we've lost a few members and it's, it's very sad. So we're here today to, to show you a little bit about the work that we do and the importance of that, of that work. But what are some of the connections that CCWP makes between organizing and healing? Here it is, you know, here I am. When I entered the prison system at age 24, I was coming from a very violent situation. Um, I'm a survivor of, of physical violence. Um, I was running away and I came to California and I, I ended up in prison um, for a life sentence. And if it wasn't for organizations like CCWP that was created inside of a prison for one reason, but then took on the whole tyrannical system to make sure that they could provide basic needs and it's because of funding that they're able to provide those basic needs to women inside of prison to women outside of prison and and those who don't identify as 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 women but also need the support especially our trans community um, we've been able to provide support for the trans community that has oftentimes been left out of I think messaging left out of the conversation, left out of funding. And so the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, although we call ourselves that coalition, we're a very diverse coalition of members that support all gendered bodies, including men. So just to wrap up, I wanna share just a couple of things about some campaigns that we're working on right now. Uh, our Drop LWAP campaign, which is uh, LWAP stands for Life Without the Possibility of Parole. We've been calling on the last two governors to commute all 5,000 uh, Life Without the Possibility of Parole sentences. Uh, of course, that has not happened, but we've been very successful at winning commutations for many of our members 
inside. And so we've been able to bring about 127 folks home in the last few years. So we're very happy about that work. And we're continuing to challenge the governor to make sure that we have a California that we want, one that does not include extreme sentences. Uh, Me Too behind bars. Um, prison system can be a very volatile place for those who are there. And there's, there's violence that happens from correctional staff that needs to be addressed. So we have a campaign that addresses that violence, that uh, addresses that neglect uh, that women experience, Me Too behind bars. And we're starting to, to get some traction with that campaign because women need to be protected even inside of a prison. And our policy and advocacy campaigns are growing. I just, I'll mention very briefly some campaigns that uh, we've had in the last couple of years that produced some successful legislation. Uh, two years ago, we worked with Senator Mitchell and Senator Lara, and we were able to help pass SB 1393, which added judicial discretion to a five-year mandatory uh, prison enhancement sentence. And so we're very proud of that work, as well as SB 134, which eliminated a one-year enhancement. So we've done work around sentencing reform and then conditions. We were able to raise the indigent threshold through uh, AB 2533, a bill sponsored by uh, Assembly Member Mark Stone, so that incarcerated people would have more access to hygiene items, to stamps and envelopes, notary services, to medical care without having to pay a copay. So grassroots organizing is more than just folks sitting around singing kumbaya and holding hands. It's real work. It takes a lot of sacrifice and it takes a lot of power. So when we talk about mobilization and building power, to, to bring about real change for the community, lasting change, and to rebuild and reinvent people. I don't think there's any, anything better than grassroots organizing. So I thank you for your time on behalf of CCWP. Thank you for listening and please visit our website. All right, let's give her some love. I know you're not in person, but thank you for that. That was so beautiful and such a good segue into, into the panel. Uh, the stories you shared, just how healing justice, direct service, um, cash assistance, all of that is integrated into grassroots organizing. I just think that was just a good way to really, really build, build off of the definition. And so we're gonna have Abraham go into this next. And, um, and after this, we're gonna have a few questions that we're gonna be asking the, the two of you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Abraham Medina, and uh, right now currently I serve as a convener and coordinator for the California Alliance for Youth and Community Justice. And um, this trajectory of, of the role that I am serving in now is one that, um, definitely survivor of violence or domestic violence and you know uh seven years old my mom got the courage to uh leave uh, the, the violence that we were experiencing you know and so we set on this journey that eventually uh led us to tj and eventually uh to the us the however like that journey you know is it was a difficult one and one where we were separated uh experienced family separation experienced uh, being in a place, not being able to leave, to go, not knowing what my mom was at. And so just that experience of like a, the, the form, a form of child detention um, really, really impacted me growing up. And so I, I, I grew up here in the United States knowing that there was ICE, that there was police uh, and, and the harms of con police contact, the harms of uh, contact with probation and so by the time I got in high school, I didn't see myself as an organizer, but I saw myself as wanting to do something about the things that I saw around me, like the gang injunction they were proposing in my high school um, or in the area surrounding my high school. Uh, and so wanting to, wanting to kind of do something about that situation that, um, that we were experiencing, we, uh, I started to connect, right? Like having those roots in, in the community, started to connect with others 
by the time we were in high school, we really uh, were able to activate our network to uh, organize our high school walkouts. Um, and that journey, right, to organizing on, on the, in the community, grassroots organizing, to now a, new, a, a challenge, right? We took on, we took on the, the school to prison to deportation pipeline. We went from young people, like from, I uh, went from a young person, the trajectory, uh, you know, that uh, in being able to like, know something was wrong, wanted to do something about it, to articulating a problem, to even proposing the solutions. And I think uh, that journey of, of getting to learning and getting to restorative justice, uh, transformative justice, and then proposing frameworks to continue grassroots organizing, even at a state level, is that journey that I, I I, I continue to walk on even to this day. And so what, what, I, what I want to share a little bit about is just that, that challenge of, of uh, collectivizing our power, you know, grassroots community organizing across the state. And currently uh, as coordinator and convener of a statewide alliance, uh, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, we, we definitely, uh, it is a struggle to create those process, that process to collectivize our power. Um, and it sometimes it takes years. It may, and then to funders, it may seem that we're not uh, accomplishing much because uh, you know the focus is often on, on campaign victories. Uh, but um, but part of that is is being able to just look at look at things differently. And I want to share this uh, um, this this screen with you. I don't know if y'all can see the tree. Thank you. Uh, so part of it is is in, in collectivizing our power across the state, uh, how, cultivating the greater we. It took time. So one of the key lessons is that uh, as um, in in trying to collectivize our power across the state, we had to develop uh, those criteria for deeper solidarity. Right? We had to uh, uh, create trust before we can get to deeper alignment. We had to cultivate those relationships before we could co uh, collectivize a process as a vehicle to collectivize our power. And through that journey, it might have seemed like we were not uh, accomplishing much, right? Like oftentimes the campaign victories are like the fruits of the tree. And a lot of the work, it takes place and energy is, uh, is strengthening the roots. And so um, our alliance definitely uh, came together in 2012 around one uh, uh, collective agreement to end the adultification of youth. And, and through this journey, uh, we collectivize our power to around Prop 47 and Prop 57. Uh, beyond that, right, um, it was uh, 20, 2016 to 2018, we really took that time to expand our, our deeper alignment, right, uh, collect, uh, agreement around, around process, collective process, um, what happens when there is harm, uh, you know, among organizations or disagreements among organizations, what we became a lot more resilient, we were able to activate our collective power uh, in responding to the governor's plan to close down DJJ, we, we collectivized our power and said, Yes, we must close down BJJ, but we must close it the right way. And so, getting to a process where where we can get, uh, arrive at that at, at that collective uh, agreement took time, took energy, took relationships, and it needs to be resourced. And and we also got to look at the metrics uh, that that we're using to measure success. Uh, oftentimes, it's like could could they could they uh, could they collectivize recommendations around this federal policy or statewide policy or you name it, right? Uh, but sometimes, you know, like the, the metrics also include like the fact that our members have, have remained involved, engaged, uh, and sustained involvement and participation through everything that, that, that is taking place in our communities, through all the violence we are experiencing. And that's a metric of success, a metric of buying, a, me a metric of trust, and that the relationship building has been key. Um, and so part of that, um, part of what we're trying to do right now in uh, moving forward is actually also reconsider uh, our how are we going to wield that collective power is it going to be towards we got this victory let's go to another victory um and i think we're, and we are looking at frameworks that can help us right uh, have something more sustainable and so we're looking to focus on implementation for the next two to five years as we go to our four north stars and to transform the youth just youth justice system in california propose a, a, a youth development approach to youth accountability and youth behavior and so how does that, how do we develop collective processes so that we make sure that, that, that those are directly impacted or centered in the strategy. And so that is, that, that means seeing, that's really important to us because oftentimes the strategy is probably, uh, you know, maybe driven, funder driven, 
And so it takes us time to, we still, ha I feel like we're, we're constantly trying to get a, a move like in response to this and that, or trying to be proactive. Um, but little by little, we're building, build, building the collective process to be able to drive the strategy and uh, as directly impacted folk. And, and we have one example uh, where, you know, at least uh, in, in this, in this uh, discussion of what, what is gonna replace DJJ, uh, our members are in, sir, uh, in, uh, directly engaging youth currently in DJJ. So that, you know, when we talk about what, what are those alternative facilities or if, if secure detention facilities are needed, how does, does it not erode our vision of abolition and liberation? But how is it also informed by those directly impacted? And so all that is very, very important. Uh, and lastly, what I will say is uh, we are kind of are trying to cultivate, we're continuously trying to cultivate, uh, working to cultivate the greater we. And that greater we uh, is, is something that's very important to us because uh, we need to identify right, the, the, the criteria for decision making, for transformative solidarity. So, um, you know, we began by having uh, equality of representation towards equity of representation. And now we're talking about what does regional equity mean to us? And we're gonna focus on uh, collectivize our power. How are we gonna collectivize our energy and resources to support uh, regions like the Central Valley, right? To build infrastructure and capacity and what is needed, right? And, um, and so we're realizing that in, uh, uh, the, the, the power, the struggle, it is at the county level. And we need to make sure that uh, how do we propose new models, right? Even at the local level of the way even organizations are resourced so that organizations at the local front, at the, at the, at in the community are resourced to win. And, uh, you know, and I think that that's very important for us, everything, uh, every, um, and it interconnects what was discussed earlier around that ecosystem of infrastructure that is needed. Uh, so um, I just want to share a, a, one more picture. Uh, and this is us um, in our in our strategy meeting in uh, in December, and so you know we continue to walk on this journey toward four North Stars. Uh, it may it's definitely uh, a challenge, uh, you know, and uh, I, I definitely look forward to continuing uh, to walk towards the North Stars and uh, uh, build the, the infrastructure process uh, that that is needed to collectivize our power. Thank you, Abraham. And again, that sharing that story uh, for yourself personally, and also really talking about the journey for an organization, right? It's like when you're talking about the tree and thinking about how many, including funders, but even people in the, in the outside really just look at the fruit, but not think about the importance of the strong roots that are needed. And the need to go slow to go fast. So yeah, this is this is great. I mean, this is gonna get into some of the questions that I wanna dive into. And I'm just gonna jump right in because, you know, this is this is like a funder education series and we all know for grassroots organizing, the hardest dollars to find are large multi-year general operating support, right? That's like unrestricted resources. And the question I wanted to ask is that, what are the impacts of the, the funding silos that are created by philanthropy? What are the impacts of that? You all have already talked about it in different ways. So, so some examples is like, you know, there might be a grant that comes out that's just for cash assistance um, or like trauma and healing, but, but then they're like, don't, none of that should touch a campaign, right? That could be something like, um, or you, could, you, might, you might get like organizing dollars that really say, so every single member must um, be active and participate in this campaign. But you know, we work with a lot, of, a lot of queer youth who were not ready to come out into a campaign, right? So how do you, so basically how do, these kind of funding silos really limit and impact us. So I'm gonna let um, Romarilyn, you, you can start first and then Abraham, you could kind of riff off of that. Great question, Alex, thank you. I, I think when it comes to, to funding and 
you know, money is restricted to certain types of activities or, or membership or general operating, it, it creates more work on the organization. And when organizations are small and they don't have enough funding in the first place, it makes it really difficult um, to grow your organization, to listen to the needs of your members, the needs of the community, and try to support them if you don't have dollars that support the needs of the org. So you're right, when, when money is you know, tied to a specific thing and it's not unrestricted money, then it's hard because most small grassroots organizations are dealing with members who have long histories of trauma. And most organizations, especially small grassroots organizations, you know, folks in there are not getting paid very much money. They work long hours. They, you know, they, they don't live, you know, in, you know, a lot of the best neighborhoods. I mean, they're really, everyone's struggling to make sure that the community needs are met. Um, it's important to fund the work. Um, the work needs to be funded. The workers need to be taken care of. And sometimes I don't think funders understand that the workers need to be taken care of in order to continue to do the work. And so, you know, funds need to be unrestricted and available so that folks doing the work can have time to heal themselves. Because oftentimes, as we've all spoke about today, those most impacted by an issue, you know, are doing the work. And so re-traumatization can happen, you know, fatigue and burnout can happen. And so having funds available to help support the workers is extremely important. Um, and I, I guess the last thing I, I would say to that around funding is the organization and the members and the people know what they need. You know, if funders want to know how to support an organization, just ask, you know, and I'm sure those organizations would come forward and say, we need X amount of dollars to do X, Y, and Z. And yeah, I think that would help out so many more organizations and make sure that they're not only meeting the needs of their members and the community, but also taking care of themselves. Thank you, that's great. Thank you, um, what I would add is that oftentimes, right, we, we are challenged and tasked to collectivize our power across the state and to, and that is a journey, a collective journey into deciding, right, having those relationships as I mentioned earlier, deciding kind of how, how we're gonna, uh, where are we gonna allocate our resources and, and energy towards. Um, and I think it would also it would uh, be helpful to have some some type of common strategy across foundations and initiatives. Sometimes, you know, uh, oftentimes it'd be like strategic. Uh, so there's some barriers, not only in terms of the way the funding's made, but also some barriers. Uh, I don't know, systemic or structural that are, you know, maybe oh, I, I may not be able to do that right now because of my strategic plan, or I may not be able to do that right now because of a board member uh, or the board. And so I wonder what, you know, just that, that some of those silos are, are sometimes uh, more, much more systemic and much more structured, structural. And our, our goal too as organizers is to also address that and change that. Um, we do need flexibility. Um, and also maybe uh, the way that we think about funding, maybe perhaps, I know it's, it's a difficult moment, right, economically, but multiple year grants, uh, one, you know, and also uh, general operating support and also, you know, to resource that ecosystem and the infrastructure that we need. So, uh, you know, uh, how could we leverage that general operating support to respond, be responsive to the needs and also be able to build a capacity for a communications person or a, a policy director. Um, our, our, our members are, are having to write like, uh, we have to do everything that they're responding to in the community, organize in, in their community, and then also 
uh, you know, uh, in order to connect to the state le at the state level, you know, so serve that the dual function of uh, policy analysts and, and data analysts. And so I think that um, part of that is uh, how do we how do we break down those silos in philanthropy in real meaningful and tangible ways? Great, thank you. Yeah, I think this is really helpful just for everyone to hear the, the contours, the layers, the kind of visible and invisible work it takes to do the organizing. And the next question kind of gets into that a little bit more too, because I think there is not a real understanding of what it takes to do the kind of organizing. And so one example is thinking about the role of political education in grassroots organizing. And if you all could talk a little bit about the role of political education in your work and sort of like that journey that you all have been talking about, like what is it like to, um, how does that impact the work and how does it happen over time? So Abraham, I'm gonna let you go first this time and then we'll go to Marilyn. Most definitely. The, the political education, right, it, it happens uh, also sometimes, a lot of times through direct experience, right? Uh, we know something wrong, we wanna uh, address it, we wanna challenge, uh, challenge it, change it. And I think it's just also like about sharpening the skills. And so that, that journey is like, not only uh, from, from how is it informed by personal experience, but also as a collective conversation right now in terms of, you know, for formerly incarcerated folk, uh, how do we build those leadership pipelines uh, to, to, to be able to be able to write not only from uh, that, that like current, like I, I could describe right now, we have a team that's focused on you, on identifying you that are to be released in DJJ. How do we connect them to write resources and if they, and if they want to get involved also an opportunity to begin that journey. Uh, and so for us, political education, right, is, is, a, is part of that journey. Um, and so our community has prioritized creating a, a space for that. So we, once a month, we have a community, community learning space and we've been in, and the general operating support funds ha have been able, we have flexibility to be able to respond to that identified collective need and resource it. So we are reaching out, right, like to what are the needs we, uh, we began with uh, conversation around what is anti-blackness? How do we dismantle it? Uh, political education, um, you know, around uh, 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 healing supports, or even the, like how do we engage in this conversation about transformative justice uh, internal and when we we have so much internalized like, the culture of punishment that we are submitted to from 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 even before birth, and so um, part of that is like uh, that that political education journey, at least for us collectively, looks like a common space, a monthly space. And uh, right now we constantly assess from our members, what are the, those collective uh, learning needs? And we create a learning community to, to be responsive to that. Awesome, thank you, Abraham. Great, great ideas. Thanks for sharing those. That's similar to what Abraham was saying, you know, our political education through CCWP We've been around 25 years, so we have many committees and groups um, from you know, our drop LWAP to legislation to Me Too behind bars trauma, but the political education piece we've really been building out over the last couple of years, getting involved in policy and advocacy work, making sure that the members who are being released are coming into that work so that they understand not only the value of their lived experience and what that can do to bring about policy change, legislative change, going to Sacramento, you know, lobbying on bills, you know, advocating for certain policies, uh, speaking in committee, introducing them to elected officials to talk about their experiences with incarceration or with trauma or with a certain type of sentencing. I mean, it's it's super important to make sure that the person who is addressing a certain issue has a level of expertise. And I think those who have been directly impacted by an issue are the experts. 
And so just being able to share that, because I think when we go into the Capitol and we meet with a legislator or even their staff, you know, providing that political education about our experiences in, with incarceration, with the criminal justice system, maybe with policing, um, maybe with gender violence, you know, it goes a really long way. It's been huge. And I think bringing about change in the last uh, three or four years um, here in California. But then also within our own organization, you know, we have a lot of volunteers. We have a lot of folks that want to come into CCWP. They're not incarcerated. A lot of them are connected to a college or a university or they're a retired professional or an attorney. We have folks from various law schools and law clinics that are offering support. So we need to be able to educate those volunteers on the need, sometimes the triggers of the members that they may be working with, you know, the, the basic, the basis of our work and how survivors, especially survivors of trauma and violence, you know, need to be addressed. We have to political education around language, not using certain terms to define people. It's been a huge part of our work using more humanizing, inclusive language. So, you know, um, political education is, is critical to making sure that the messaging, the messaging, messaging is correct. So that folks understand where you're coming from and that they, they know what the, the problems are and how they can be of service and be of help. Great, thank you both. I think those, those are really good examples of how to kind of lay it out so people can understand how it looks. And, and yes, um, the message is really thinking about that multi-year general, general operating dollars. And then, yes, we have a good question from Mehdi Zhang, who we will get to later in the conversation. Um, I'm going to... So we're running a little short on time in terms of the next question. So I'm just going to ask it and if you all can just give a little bit of a shorter um, answer and then we can get to Tamu and open it up to um, Q&A. So this next question is to, to really just think about what is the role of elders in your organizing? And Romarilyn, you can go first. Okay. Um, I, I think the role of elders is similar to the role of, of role of elders in the community. You know, they bring the wisdom, they bring the history. Uh, oftentimes they bring the peace and sometimes, you know, they, they bring the control. So having elders in our, in our spaces, in our groups, in our committees, in our work, I think is valuable. We have many members who are elders, not just, with CCWP as I'm a long time member of CCWP, but also members who have just lived, you know, a certain length of time that can expose people to different perspectives. You know, how language has changed over the decades, how positions have changed over the decades and perspectives. So it's important to have, have elders in your work so that they can bring, you know, that I, I think that critical um, witness to the changing times. Thank you. And uh, just in parts, in, in terms of CAYCJ, um, the elders have really right, uh, supported us in terms of the, uh, the much needed support around healing, you know, and so in, uh, being able to access uh, ceremonies uh, and, and have that support system of the elders uh, has been transformational for, for myself, but also uh, for other members in our, in our collective space. And so we're trying to make sure that um, we, we build those relationships with our elders in the communities, uh, with the elders in the movement, and that uh, we, that is considered as part of our collective aligned space. Uh, how do we resource that? How do we interconnect that? Um, and how do we, we make sure that it's uh, uh, part of center of our core work? 
Uh, and so, yes, it's, it's, it's definitely have been helpful in moments when we faced organized attack by law enforcement, uh, where to be able to uh, have the elders to hold, help us hold space, uh, mediate space um, when there's disagreement among leadership in our, in our, in our team, in our collective space. And so uh, that, that's definitely been key. And that's what it's looked like, at least within CAYCJ as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I definitely think that that's part of the, the greater we, how do we make sure that uh, the, the, our connection with the elders is not a side thing. And it's, and it's a core of what we, what we do and who we are. My bad. Um, thank you. We're going to have time for more questions. And please, folks should should drop more questions um, right now. We're going to have Tamu go next and then open up for Q&A. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thanks for everyone for being here. And um, I just want to start off by saying that I always tend to be really more deeply invigorated about this body of work um, and inspired when sitting next to, even if it is only virtually <laughs> these days, the folks who are doing the kind of incredible transformational work with such deep commitment, clarity, and, and strategic mind. So just a big up uh, to Alex and Mo Marilyn and Abraham for all that you're doing um, and the beautiful way that you kind of told your individual stories and wove that into what it's important for funders to hold. So thank you for that. Um, I, I want to just sort of acknowledge too that there's just sort of a, a, a piece that, that feels like I know we have probably as funders heard this a lot and continue to hear it, but I feel like it's important for us to name an inherent contradiction um, when we think about funders and supporting community organizing. And I think we need to grapple with it and sit with it when pondering the question about the who, what, and why for funding organizing. And, and what I'm about to sort of get into just really briefly is really what is the, the paradox of the origin story of philanthropy, <laughs> which I think we need to just acknowledge the fact that um, the corpus of most major philanthropy is earned on the backs of those whose oppression we're actually trying to mitigate through organizing. And so there's an irony and a contradiction and tension that I think we're always riding in that. And that's by way of the fact that it's really the racist capitalist structures that create and sustain corporate and individual wealth that we're actually using to fund this work. And if anything, I'm hoping that we continue to grapple with as an individual uh, grant maker or as institutions, the importance of, of why we need to just acknowledge the importance of us doing right by these kinds of movements. Um, because we're playing with dirty money. I'm just going to say it. Um, and I feel like that the field is ironically uh, guilty of practices and patterns that have been wielded in ways that can perpetuate the inequities that we see. And so that happens at a meta level when we're thinking about where our money sits and where we're investing to preserve our corpus. And it happens at a micro level, right, in terms of the funding choices we make, the strategies we move, and the in interactions we have with grantees and other contractors and other folks. So I just want to name that. And for me, that just underscores the need for us as uh, folks in philanthropy to sort of bring uh, a consciousness and how we show up as a force for good and being a, a proactive um, uh, partner in, in ways that make sense that don't further do harm. And so what that means to me when I think about what we're grappling with in this moment in particular um, is that I think we have to start with being rooted in a commitment to a strong alignment um, and in some ways co-conspiratorship, for lack of a better word, with the movement. And I think that that requires a level, a level of sort of rigor and discipline and ongoing inquiry about what it means to transform systems and what's the appropriate lane for philanthropy in that context. And so when I think about one of the, the key pieces that we have to sit with in this field of philanthropy is also about disrupting what is often a, a more transactional nature around grant making that's endemic in the field. And I think uh, both Will Marilyn and Abraham have spoken to this in, in many ways um, in some of the stories that they've been telling about their experiences. Um, and so I feel like what there exists within philanthropy often is a paradigm that's 
that's rooted in kind of this idea of return on investment, right? So we put out X number of dollars for X units of service or X number of wins or X number of whatever, right? And I think that that is rooted in sort of our history of having a bit of like a charity focused model that is a little bit more short sighted and doesn't lend itself well to the sophistication of what we're really talking about when we're talking about transforming systems. And so um, that carries over into how we evaluate what we expect of our grantees and, and how we develop our strategies. And so even when we are stepping more affirmatively into the spaces around funding, organizing and this work, um, an observation you know, that I have had over the years has really been around that even when we step into these places, we start doing what I think is sort of like a scoreboard model, right? We're tallying the number of policy victories that um, individual organizations or certain coalitions do and reward those with the longest list and, and um, but not really sort of having the discipline to recognize that not all policy change is good policy change when we're really talking about getting at the root causes of the inequities that we see. And sometimes that those policy wins can actually reinforce um, the systems of oppression that we're saying we're supporting organizing in service of. And so ideally we should be leaning into efforts. And I think Alex spoke to this in his opening. We should be leaning into efforts that are actually helping to support shift power and fundamentally change the material conditions that hold a particular problem in place, rather than seeing it in these very um, sort of disparate episodic pieces that are a policy that's just sort of floating out there. Um, and I feel like I've also seen and observed um, philanthropic, I'll call them architect models, <laughs> um, where, where philanthropy can get overly prescriptive um, in the target, setting the target or defining what is the right moment for X action or setting tables um, and saying that these are the right set of actors for you all to figure out what you do next and anointing sort of the familiar groups who tend to get lots of money and, and inevitably what we do is create extra work for the grantees to show up in ways that are responsive to sort of what money is being put on the table but it's not organic or part of an actual sort of deeper sort of political education and alignment work that is happening so I'm laying out this as just sort of an example of how in many ways we can actually start to disrupt um, what are sort of natural ecosystems or mechanisms for getting to more transformational change. And so I, while I'm not suggesting um, in any way that we don't think about the impact of our strategies um, and thinking about being st um, strategic in the way that we, we do grant making, but what I am saying or offering on the table is that we sh maybe should be thinking, particularly in moments like these, how do we ask a different set of questions about what success looks like versus defining it as Abraham was talking about versus policy wins or number of people served or the number of people who turned out, right? Um, but really to what end is the organizing happening? And in service of whom is really at the heart of what I feel like this moment and beyond calls for is really about letting the movement lead, which I think is a principle that we really need to be leaning into more and more. And so how are we focusing, as Alex was talking about, on efforts that are supporting building power and centering those who are most impacted? And so I would, you know, suggest, you know, and some of the things I know many sort of groups of funders have been talking about for a while is like, how do we look at ourselves and our grant making practices and think about what does it actually mean for us to center um, base building groups and thinking about that through organizations and organizing groups who are really recruiting and developing the capacities and leadership of folks that we just heard about in some of the stories that uh, Will Marilyn and, and Abraham were talking about, those who have the lived experience and, and sort of are the ones who are setting the demands. Um, and not in an ad hoc way, but in sort of the deep practice of political education way that we were just talking about, uh, or that the last point I think was made. Um, and that we are creating a sort of these organizations and groups of organizations that are committed to holding systems accountable, the long arc of change, recognizing that the policy win is one marker, but really it is about um, changing and um, morphing those sort of systems to move completely differently and be in service of folks in a different way. And I don't want to lose the point that I think is really important also about the importance of having a racial justice frame and understanding sort of systemic racism. And I feel like those who are doing good organizing work are holding all of that. Abraham, we spoke this idea about how do we even unpack this idea of anti-blackness and how does that show up and what does it mean for us to dismantle it, right? That is the work of real organizing to really be able to do that level of analysis. It's not just mobilizing and turning people out, right? And so I think the other part of the equation, um, so it's 
looking at sort of the groups, the organizing groups themselves, but going back to where Alex started about sort of how do we think about looking at building strong movement ecosystems? What might it look like if we were actually measuring our progress and investments as funders towards supporting those organic ecosystems who are building this really interdisciplinary bench that can sustain over time, right? That are centering base building groups um, and that doesn't mean that as a funder, we all have to fund only organizing. Sure, we can fund other types of groups, but I think we also should be thinking about, um, you know, whether it's legal or narrative work or, you know, advocacy groups. But ultimately, if we're doing that in a way where it's tied to or in service of organizing groups and sort of a particular point of view that is emanating from that, we're in a better position, right? And so um, in terms of being able to get to real transformative change. And I really want to underscore the point that Abraham was also talking about, about the importance of us supporting this, um, the cultivation of space and time to create strategic relationships and alignment. Like that, that is invaluable. Um, and so I think that that really, again, when we're talking about this long arc of change, is going to be something that is so critical and necessary for us to be able to have lasting impact. And if we as funders are focused then on what it means to build that type of infrastructure, then the policies come and go, the way we mobilize come and go, the way we have to support um, individuals um, may shift, um, the way I pivot, but that we have this strong infrastructure that is organic and aligned and has done that work together so that they can stand up and push when the moment arises, um, right? And so if we as a field were organized around these concepts, um, particularly um, again in this moment, and we were focused then on adding fuel to that versus the checkbox of policy wins as our only metric of progress, I think we would get much further. I think the groups on the ground would be much more impactful. And I think we wouldn't try find ourselves in this position of trying to twist these organizations into um, twist these organizations into a pretzel and trying to respond to that. So I want to speak to, I only have a minute or so left, so I want to speak to a couple of uh, key issues. Um, one is um, you know, there's a, there's a question that often comes up in philanthropy about this idea of risk um, when we're funding different types of work. And I wanna just underscore that this self-fulfilling prophecy is what gets created when we have conversations about risk. That we're only funding those who are well-funded, well-known groups who have higher visibility and capacity. Um, those for some reason are always seen as those who are not risky, but that non-traditional configurations outside of maybe traditional nonprofit um, organization structures also are examples of things that tend to be seen as much more risky. But it's sometimes those large and more established groups that the truth of the matter is, if you dig a little bit further, are actually bolstered by the work of those who have not been funded as often or funded at lower levels than sort of these groups or diminished to being subcontractors under larger grants that are in service. But they're ultimately the ones who are the boots on the ground. They're the ones who are doing a lot of some real sort of risk in terms of they're putting their own bodies, time, credibility, and, and spirit on the line. To move the work. Um, and so our, it is in our imperative to really kind of think about what is the due diligence that we do to understand the ecosystems and the dynamics within it to be responsible grant makers and funders when we're thinking about that work. And I know I'm probably going to go a little bit over, um, but I want to just make another um, point. Um, I, I want to encourage uh, us to really not um, romanticize organizing and going back to where we started too about this, this is really hard work that's tied to some of the deepest social injustices that folks are experiencing. So when we think about those who are doing the organizing and those who've been exposed to violence or intergenerational harm, that they're dealing with this in a real level and real time and crises and trauma. And so how do we also ensure that not only are we doing flexible resources that allow um, individual organizations to be responsive, um, and to be nimble and being able to, to do what is needed to be able to support their base. Um, but I think it's also um, important um, to, to think about um, organizing as, um, organizing as, a, as, as both a means and an end and a way that we're actually helping to support the healing work and the transformative justice type of work that we see happening inside organizing. And so it, it can be funded either directly but it also can be funded through the way of having indirect or having uh, general operating support dollars. 
And I would put a last challenge on the table, um, which is that we tend to externalize and philanthropy about dealing with our own, dealing with trauma and making sure that that happens within sort of those folks who are doing organizing. But we as philanthropy are not immune. <laughs> um, that we in and of ourselves, we actually um, sometimes come from a press group, come from um, our own, bringing our own trauma to the work. And even those who are sitting in what would be relative privilege, they actually have work to do themselves, right? And so I feel like that's it, that it's important for us to also be checking ourselves in terms of doing some of the deeper work um, that is necessary, that is healing and that's transformational and allows us to be grounded and clear in the way that we do that. And that includes not just sort of the, the trauma and healing work, but I think it also requires that we do a kind of interrogation of our strategies and our approaches and our culture in a way that actually is about pushing, um, pushing the envelope, doing our own political education so that we can actually show up in ways that are more consistent across the board in supporting movement and organizing. And I know I'm way over time, so I'm going to be quiet um, and stop there. All right, that was beautiful. Thank you to the three of you all. And I got all, a whole bunch of other questions now. I'm going to stick to the program. And um, we have about maybe 10 minutes for some of these, the two questions that Eddie Zhang has put forward. And um, I just wanna just appreciate the three of you all for just having like really honest, real talk, uh, the kind of vulnerability that's needed. Like a lot of the co-conspirating strategizing that's needed is these kind of conversations because it takes a lot of trust for people in the field to reveal all of our weaknesses, right? And also for people in philanthropy to do the same thing. So thank you for that. Okay, so the first question we have is, um, is it possible for community organizations to stop relying on funding from city and government philanthropy to, su to sustain their work? If so, what does it take to accomplish it? I know, easy. Um, I will put it in the chat as well. Anyone want to take, um, and not everyone has to answer it either, um, just so we can get to more questions. So maybe we'll take like one person's, look like Abraham was, I don't know, <laughs> I couldn't tell. Um, I would. We're, we're talking about like at least what, what does it mean to to uh, generate cultivate economic power among formerly incarcerated right disenfranchised uh, undocumented uh, refugee communities and so I think part of that is uh, you know it hasn't become a, a centering conversation at least right now as a collective space but part of that is it, I, we, we do think it's connected to this uh, conversation around self-reliance, self-determination, and uh, how do we cultivate that and generate that within our communities. And so part of it was, uh, you know, also us struggling with this conversation in a way that, as someone mentioned earlier, you know, um, this is, this is like we, we see it as kind of, uh, in some ways, liberating the funds uh, that belong to the community. Yeah. And so I think that, that some, some approaches to it has also been that, that uh, you know, um, county budgets are more documents, and and so what is it when when uh, we're resourcing the, the police department, but not uh, other? That's the only thing for uh, like uh, addressing youth behavior in a, in, the, in the most well resourced of a city. And so I think that when we're looking at uh, what's being resourced, we're thinking of also like uh, liberate like that. That is a money we need to redirect it right. And, uh, and when it comes to philanthropy, I think it's also in a way that how we did like that, that what Tamu mentioned earlier, how do we have approaching that context? Um, and so I, I don't have much of an answer, but I feel like we, what I'm trying to say is that, that, that uh, we are struggling with that, with that conversation collectively. Um, I guess that's what I can say right now. That's great, Abraham. I'll I'll just add just a few things. I, I think community organizations don't rely on government, city, or, or philanthropy to sustain their organizations. It's a mix. Um, 
organizations are full of community members. And as Abraham just really laid out, I think the city and the state has a responsibility to support their members of their community. So organizing, you know, a group of members to provide supportive services is, is money that they should have already. And as Tamu talked about, you know, capitalism and racism, you know, that the, the money that oftentimes philanthropy holds is, is, is money that oppressed people have earned for them. So it's a way for philanthropy to give back and it should be an honor and a duty for philanthropy to give that money back to the people, especially those populations of which they, they, they stand on their neck every day. You know, so um, I, it's a good question. I, I really didn't like the way the question was worded because I, I don't think we rely on state government. In fact, grassroots organizations very seldom take money from the government because they don't want government control or government oversight. So that's why we struggle. So when we do take money, we want that money to be unrestricted general operating money so that we can serve the people and not serve the government or serve the foundation. Right. Um, I'm going to just move to the next one and then give you all like a round of final like one minute. Um, this next one kind of gets into like our movement culture and it's around how restored, what does restorative justice look like and how does it um, being practiced in organizing spaces without canceling anyone. So like there's a big thing around cancel culture and uh, knowing that a lot of um, conflicts happen within our own communities or intra-communities, Black, Asian, um, within like men, women. So like, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to jump on this. And this will be the, pretty much the last one. And I'm going to give you all one more minute um, just to kind of close out. What I, what I can speak to is just the CAYCJ process. Um, and part of that is, is we're trying to uh, have a collective conversation around challenging the, the punishment paradigm. How does that show up in courts? How does that show up in the, in, the, in the fact that we don't have a justice system, we have a punishment system, we have a youth punishment system and how we're challenging that. But also then how, does, how do we internalize that, that culture of punishment? Uh, and so I think we, we had a, um, you know, that, that collective uh, process building and trust is necessary because sometimes we express, we, we experience challenges in the middle of trying to develop uh, and have these, a process and have these conversations. So last year, we had a situation in which restorative justice, transformative justice became from its front and center. Uh, and, and in that conversation, it became about what is that values that we, that we want to embody in, as a collective, as an alliance? How, how are we not gonna, uh, what is transformative accountability? How does it look like in a way that doesn't throw anybody away? How does it look like in a, in a way that addresses the harm and meets everybody's needs? And so we're asking those, like we're, we're, we're at a point where we are struggling with all of that in all of the shapes and forms. And, uh, and definitely uh, that, is, that is also one thing that uh, is often not resourced. How, you know, that, 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 uh, and it takes time, right? It's uh, like we had that conversation uh, last September, October, November, December. And then, you know, and so I think like, the, like having, getting to a point where we actually articulate uh, 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 and, and uh, practice something that could be restorative justice or transformative justice that takes, uh, that takes a time. And so often, like what we experienced in, in the past too is that. Sometimes when we don't have that common shared language, shared values, shared understanding, we cannot just airdrop a, a restorative justice. We have to cultivate a culture. And, that, and, and what I just shared right now is us uh, attempting to cultivate that culture to be able to sustain the future models or approaches to accountability and justice that we envision in a way that does not replicate a, a punishment system uh, rooted in colonialism and slavery. Beautifully said, thank you.
So I wanna start to close this out and just say that we went pretty deep on a lot of various things and in a very short amount of time. And I just wanna appreciate you all for being able to do that. And this basically, I want, I want everyone to be able to share like what's one thing you want folks to walk away with, right? What's one, like what's one message? And um, for me, it was very clear like there's common threads around like the long journey that it takes for this kind of organizing and that you are on the offense and defense. It's all integrated with the trauma and healing that we live in right now. And that really it's about trusting the field. It's, it's not, it's not philanthropy's money. It's not the government's money. It's the people's right. And then how do we create more spaces like this where we actually can co-conspire and co-strategize and have that kind of trust? So that's kind of like my takeaway. Um, I want to just um, see who wants to go first um, to kind of share their takeaway or what you want folks to walk away with. Ro Marilyn, you want to go first? No? <laughs> All good. <laughs> Using facilitator privilege, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I'll I'll go. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the the one thing or one message and what came to my mind was pretty pretty simple, pretty basic. You know, sharing is caring. You know, if 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 you have it to give, give it. You know, I think that's our responsibility as human beings to take care of one another, to reduce the harm, to reduce you know, the impact of poverty on people that can't take care of themselves. Yeah. I mean, I've learned so much for, you know, over the past 30 years with being incarcerated, you know, now being an organizer in the community. All of our lives are connected. The interconnectedness that we have, the intersectionality that exists between us all, you know, should never be overlooked because you never know when you might be the one in need. So I'll just leave with that, you know. Um, give your flowers to people while they're alive. You know, I always tell my students and, and my friends, you know, respect me, take care of me while I'm here. Because when I'm gone, you know, I'm gone. So take care of the people around you if you can. Tamu, you want to go? Wait, so where are you going? Okay, yeah, I was like, I look like I thought I saw someone coming up. Um, so yeah, I guess I would say, um, you know, to the, the panelists and all, or I think all the folks who are in sort of movement and organizing spaces continue to challenge us um, to think differently about how we support you better. And I don't, I, I always feel bad that, that there's a the power dynamic that folks feel like they can't be honest. Being honest helps us be better. So I just would say that to you um, and to my fellow um, philanthropic organization folks. Uh, we just as we are looking externally for massive levels of systems of change, this moment is actually challenging us to show up different and how we support transformation. And that means that changing ourselves. So that's our political education. That's looking at long-term funding. That's looking at reducing some of the barriers to flexible dollars. That's about centering an organizing approach to building power. And I. I um, encourage us all to, to find our people. Um, there's a growing critical mass of folks who are interested in challenging the field in this way. Find our people and help move the field in order so we can do this better. I would, I would say that uh, um, how do we resource organizing in a sustainable and whole person dignified way and I, when I think of that, uh, you know, I think of some of our elders in like, uh, you know, in some of our community that have been doing organizing for uh, 20, 30, 40 years and now like uh, maybe have heart conditions, you know, or young or young organizers like in their 30s with heart conditions. In their 40s. So it's like uh, sometimes that organizing is like, how do we take care of, of those on the front lines and 
you know, just thinking about how our, like constantly our, our, our groups and organizations are struggling with young people, some of the membership passing away. Um, and so how do we, you know, when, when, and thinking of the families and the children that stay behind, how do we support, uh, how do we provide a space not only to collectivize power, but to remember that every, the contributions were meaningful and that we contribute to uh, people that may be connected to those that contribute so much time and energy and efforts to the collective space and to the work. And so, I don't know, all, sometimes, you know, we're thinking about like, you know, health insurance or life insurance or, 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 or retirement, like, you know, our, our, our community members uh, uh, give so much of themselves. So, so we're trying to also have a conversation of how that's, how do we, how do we center ourselves also in that? And I guess in part of the conversation, uh, welcome this, uh, how does how is philanthropy and solidarity uh, with those conversations taking place right now? Thank you. That was really beautiful, and and thank you, folks, for staying on. I'm just gonna hand it back to Adrian to see if there are anything, any kind of closing thoughts. Um, just want to say thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you so much, Alex, for moving us through that conversation. Abraham, Romerilyn, and Tamu, it was an honor to hear you all speak on this subject. Um, I just dropped a link to next week's webinar on the intersections of Im immigration and incarceration, which will pick up a lot of these threads. And you all will be receiving an email from me with a survey to gather your feedback from this last part of our funder education series. Thanks so much, everyone. Take good care of yourselves and each other.